All right, let's do that. Let's turn our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11 as we are continuing our study through the book of Hebrews. Also, mark your Bibles in Genesis chapter 22. Hebrews chapter 11, Genesis 22, good to see everyone here. We're excited, of course, being a uh, a baptism Sunday. Also, if you didn't bring a Bible, raise your hand because we are going to be walking through Genesis 22. Get a pen and a piece of paper out if you take notes. Um, Just excited about this. And then afterwards, we have the potluck afterwards. So uh, it has nothing to do with pot or luck. I know we saw the hippie movie, right? But uh, (laughs) please, if you're new to Calvary Chapel, Chuck, Chuck brought them through that, okay? Matter of fact, a lot of the hippies and their testimonies thought everybody was high when they walked into a Calvary child because they would raise their hand and they would just be praising the Lord, you know. But it was a high from the most high, amen? It was a high from the most high. And we're just blessed to be part of that movement. Hebrews chapter 11, beginning with verse 17 down to verse 19. Or, yeah. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. Let's pray. So, Father, thank you, God, as we come to this time of opening your word and and reading it and asking you for the sense. Lord, I've got my notes before me, Lord, but I ask that you go beyond my notes, God, that you speak to us individually because we've come here in different ways, with different worries, different trials, mountaintops and valleys, Lord. We ask you to settle our hearts now. And Holy Spirit, speak to us in Jesus' precious name. Everyone said, amen. Amen. Well, no one likes a test, right? If you do, you're one of those different people I saw in high school who looked forward to tests. I know I never liked them. I did my best to be tested by our teachers that we had, but... I don't think we like anything in life that's going to bring pain or cause to us to be uncomfortable. We like a pain-free dentistry, don't we? Or workouts that doesn't require us to, to work out. That's right. And so too with our faith. And so too with the Lord that we serve. Yet he tests us, and you know why? It's for our own good. The word test here in the Greek in Hebrews 11 is to prove one's character and the steadfastness of one's faith. That's what that word means. The steadfastness means the unwavering in one's faith. You see, I said test, not tempt. For the scriptures tell us that God will never tempt us That's when the enemy comes in in a test. As God is testing us, the enemy comes in to tempt us. Well, God will never tempt us, but he will test us. And the reason God tests us is so that we can grow spiritually, so we can grow, that to learn to trust him in a trial, to stay calm in a storm, and to continue with him in the valley. Tests become our testimony. You've been through a test, you've been through a trial, you've gone through a storm in your life, now you, as Paul says, can minister to those who are beginning a trial, going into a a storm, beginning to be tested by their faith. And you can, can, as we would say, uh, testify that, that, that God is faithful. You will grow. You will grow through it. And you can pray with them and help them. But they have to go through that test. 
It becomes our testimony. This is what Abraham learned and probably one of the hardest tests a person could go through. Some of you have lost kids. You've, you've lost sons and daughters, grandkids and, and close friends. And it's something that really tests you. And you have to put your faith in God in the scriptures to know to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. This is a tough test that we will study, that he would go through. Yet this test, well this test will show the evidence of his faith in God encouraging us in our faith. In verse 17 of Hebrews 11, he says, by faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. Now, James tells us that faith without works is what? Is dead. But he would go on to say in James 2.21, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Survey says, yes. Yes, he was. His obedience was the evidence of his faith. Now, that verse 17, it speaks of offering up Isaac. The, the, it's a verb, the, to offer up. It's in the, what's known as the perfect tense. And what that means is it, as is being completed in intent. As far as Abraham was concerned, Isaac was a dead son walking as they ventured out in obedience to God's command. It says here, and he who had received promises, once again, offered up his only begotten son. In the past, as we have been studying Abraham in our studies in in Hebrews, we have learned also that Abraham was one obedient servant to God. And he received some of the promises of the covenant that God gave to him. And that really built up his faith. Now Abe was ready to be tested. The second offered up here, well that's in the imperfect sense, meaning not to its completeness. And we'll see more of that as we get the backstory in Genesis. The backstory of this heavy test is found in Genesis 22, which is the commentary to Hebrews 11. So let's turn there, Genesis 22. As you're turning there, flipping over, keep in mind, as we read and I comment on these verses, that this is a foreshadowing of God's son, Jesus, who was to come and be offered up, of whom Isaac was a type, remember? We talked about the types and the shadows and, 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 and things like that, the far prophecies and the near prophecies. So you gotta keep that in mind that Isaac was a type of Christ. It says there in Genesis 22, if you're there, say amen. I just like to hear that. Now it came to pass after these things. So what we've got here is a 25 or 30 years uh, which have passed between chapter 21 and 22. A time when Abraham's faith, man, it was solid. Was he perfect? No, but his faith in God was solid. And his confidence in the Lord was secure. It was a time after his son Isaac was born. He was prepared And preparation, preparation precedes examination. And this is what it was time for, the test, the exam. God tested Abraham. Now the word there for test in the Hebrew is, is, is almost similar to the word test as we shared in the Greek. Here it means testing the quality of someone or something under stress. And as I said, I can't, I could not imagine the stress that Abraham went through and given this command. But getting ahead of myself, let's continue on. 
that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said what? Here am I. Here am I. Notice that Abraham knew God's voice. This is so important to point out. So important because God's voice is going to play an important more important part in the latter verses here in the sacrifice of Isaac. But he knew God's voice. Do you know God's voice? Do we know God's voice? You see, friends, today his voice is a balanced voice of grace and truth. That's what I learned. His voice will not contradict his word. His voice will be brought to us by his spirit. So we need to walk in the spirit. We need to be in his word. We need to spend time alone with God to know when he is speaking to us and listen, when he is not. And we always share, there are so many voices out there, isn't it, right? So many voices trying to get our attention, trying to take us away from the scriptures, away from who God truly is. Do we know God's voice? Do we spend time in his word? Do we spend quiet time so that we can know it? Because being tasked with something like this, you better know that that's his voice. You better know that. And he knew it. Verse two. And then he said, this is God speaking, take now your son, Your what? Your only son. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering. That burnt offering is an all-consuming offering. On one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. This is a heavy command. This is a tough thing to hear. Everything was okay until he said, as a burnt offering. It wasn't a wave offering. It wasn't a dedication. It was a burnt, and he knew what a burnt offering was. Your only son Isaac, whom you love. Now, no takers This is the first occurrence in the Bible where we read of the word love. Write that down, man. Circle it. If you got one of our Bibles, circle it for somebody else. By the way, if you have a Bible and you don't own one, keep this one. It's our gift to you. The first time that word love is used. And it is that familial love, it is that deep love that a parent has for their child. The deep love. Parents, right? A real deep love do we have for our children? This love for his son not only heightens the pain and what he is asked to do in offering, it just makes it just that much difficult. Now, I believe that Abraham loved both of his sons. He loved Ishmael. We know that. We read that in Genesis. But he was the son of the flesh. And Isaac... Well, Isaac was the son of the promise. And this, as I said, echoes forward to John 3, 16. As to why God gives his only begotten son as an offering. It's because he loves us. And remember, God only had one son. And he gave him for us. So we may be saved and forgiven. He said, notice, go to the land of Moriah. This is another thing that, that just blows you away. Because 2 Chronicles 3.1 tells us it's there on that same mountain where, where Jerusalem is located, where the temple is built. Moriah, he says, on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Moriah, where the Lord Jesus himself will be crucified located outside of Jerusalem, known as Galgotha in Aramaic and 
Calvary in Latin, the place of the skull. Somebody may ask you, what church you go to? I go to the skull chapel. <laughs> you go to the what? Skull chapel, man, haven't you been there? Again, it's where Jesus will die on the cross for our sins. Read it later on, 2 Chronicles 3, 1, it's interesting. Verse three, so Abraham rose early in the morning. Now let me ask you, you think he got a night's sleep? I don't think so, parents. That was probably one of the restless nights he's ever had. But notice, Abraham got right on it with no hesitation. He arose early in the morning, he saddled his donkey, he took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, he split the wood for the burnt offering. He knew what, how to build an altar. He, again, knew what a burnt offering was and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. I'm sure I, Abraham is running through his mind. I know God's voice. I, I, why, I don't understand why he is commanding me to do this. He didn't know why he was being tested but he knew how to obey. You see how important that is? He knew how to obey. God wouldn't test him with this at the beginning. God allows him to learn that obedience is so important in serving him. And at this point, he doesn't know why, why God, but he knew obedience and he got up and he went. Verse four, and then on the, what day? Third day. It took him three days to get to that mountain. So underline third day. Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. As I commented on Hebrews eleven seventeen, when God told him to offer his son, the minute they stepped off on that way to Mount Moriah on day one, in Abraham's heart and his mind, it was completed by intent. It was completed by intent. And no doubt, those three days of traveling were agonizing for Father Abraham. In his heart and his mind, he, his, again, as I said, his son was a walking dead man, a walking offering. And we can only imagine the agonizing, the pain that Father Abraham went through, but how about our Heavenly Father? How he felt when the time was at hand for his son to be betrayed into the hands of executioners and be crucified. And what makes this third day even more special for Abraham, as we will see, he will receive his son back. And Isaac, as we told you, is a type of Christ. The third day should stand out for us as Christians, for it is the day that our Savior came back from the dead in the resurrection. Verse five. And Abraham said to this young, to his young men, I love this. Stay here with the donkey. Somebody's got to tend a donkey. Stay here at the foot of Moriah. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, circle that. But here it is, guys. We will come back to you. Now, the word worship there is shaka, and I just like to say that word. But this is the first time the word worship is used in reference to God in the Bible, in worshiping God. Shaka. The sacrifice of Isaac was a shadow of the greatest act of worship that would be displayed by our Savior's sacrifice on the cross. But again, notice what Abraham says by faith. We will come back to you. Did you read that? We will come back to you. He spoke this by faith. Abraham's broken, broken heart 
was comforted by the yet fulfilled promise of God, God made with Abraham that he would be a father of many nations through Isaac. And as Hebrews 118 states, flip back to Hebrews again real quick, of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called. When you're told to do hard things, friends, or you're going through a hard time, and maybe you are this morning, don't focus on what you don't know, because Abraham, again, what's going on here, man? Lord, the human sacrifice, this is what we used to do when I was a pagan. We used to practice this in, in southern Mesopotamia, in Ur, and the babies to Molech. What's going on? He didn't, he didn't understand. He didn't hold on to what he didn't know, but what, to who he knew. Amen? To, to who he knew. He knew his voice. He knew the promise. He knew the promise wasn't totally completed yet. Sure, his son Isaac was born. But he had to hold on to what he did know. And he knew God planned the future of the nation of Israel around Isaac's seed and posterity. He knew the only way that he could reconcile this sacrifice in his heart and in his mind was to obey and leave his son's life in God's hands somehow God will bring his son back because he has he is he is not one who lies he keeps his promises now back to Genesis 22 sorry but we're going like this verse 6 so Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and notice laid it on Isaac's son being the type this is the picture of the Lord carrying the cross and he took the fire in his hand and a knife. The father holds the elements of death. Christ went to the cross to experience the wrath of his father for you and me. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He would cry out. And the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, and he said, here I am, my son. Then he said, uh, look, the fire and the wood, but uh, where is the lamp for the burnt offering? It's a great question, isn't it? Uh, Dad? Isaac notices that something is missing. The lamb. Now again, don't get tired of me saying this, but this is the first time you read of the word lamb in the Bible, circle that. But the second occurrence of this word lamb is gonna blow us away. Look at verse eight. And Abraham answered him. Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Now the Hebrew, when it's translated into the English, the English translation tries to make sense of sentences, right, for us, for, for us as we're, we, we read English, you know. I have a Spanglish Bible, it helps me out there, but no, it, it helps us. I, I say that because when it says God will provide for himself the lamb, the word for is not in the original Hebrew. This is the way it should read. This is why I get excited. God will provide himself the offering. God will provide himself the offering. What is Abraham speaking of here? Ah, he's speaking of a thousand years later or so. That God's gonna provide himself the offering. And these are the greatest words Abraham ever spoke in my opinion. Not sure if he even knew what he was saying or the impact that that sentence would have on all of us this morning. But he spoke it. 
Jesus, as we know, was known as the Lamb of God. And he came to earth to take away the sin of the world. Jesus was the offering. Jesus was that body God required. No, he would never ask for a human sacrifice. This is a test, only a test. Because he had another plan. And you can go back to Genesis 3.16 for that, at the beginning of that plan. But he's testing Abraham. No, he would never ask. But the body, Hebrews tells us, remember our, our, our study back then? The body he required, this was his son. This was a, a shadow, a foreshadow of what's to come. Christ was to come and was to be offered on the cross. And by the way, Jesus would be the last lamb that would ever needed to be offered again, if I can say it that way. Now, let's step back a little bit. The writer of Hebrews is writing to Christian Hebrews who are thinking about what? Going back, right? We keep telling you that. You get tired of hearing it, but that's the purpose of the book of Hebrews, to tell Christian Hebrews not to go back to Judaism because Christ completed that. The curtain was torn, but yet they continued on offering lambs. The writer's trying to get it to his his readers that, no, the lamb has come, and the lamb has been offered, and no lamb is needed. God will provide was good enough for Isaac, so they went up together. Verse 9, and then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar, and he was good at building altars there, and placed the wood in order, and notice he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Let's not forget the faith of the son. This wasn't some little boy. Again, scholars believe he was between 25 and 30 years old. Somewhere in that. But he binds him and he lays him on an altar of sacrifice. And Isaac becomes a living example of the principle that Jesus taught when he said, whosoever loses his life for my sake will what? will gain it. Isaac is, a, is willing to be sacrificed and Abraham is believing that through the ashes God has to, God would raise his son, his son back up from the dead. Well again, him being the type of Christ, Jesus went to the cross by his own free will according to his father's plan. He would say in John 10, Therefore my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my father. He went willingly as Isaac went willingly in obedience. So let's not forget his faith. Let's not forget his obedience as well. Verse 10, and as Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son, but the angel of the Lord, circle that, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. Now, aren't you glad that Abraham knew the voice of God? And in this case, the angel of the Lord that called out to him was the voice of of the Lord, Jesus himself. It's known as a Christophany. It's it's Christ speaking prior to his incarnation, before Christmas. It is he who would, as I keep reminding you, later give of himself on that same place 
at Calvary on Mount Moriah. It is he who's speaking out to Abraham, Abraham, Abraham. And I can bet that Isaac said, hey, Dad, did you hear that? Because I know your hearing's not bad. You know, I know. Hey, Dad, did you hear that? And this is what Jesus said. Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Uh, That's Bible for you passed the test. You got an A, plus, plus, whatever it is. You see, faith, trust, and sacrifice was well, their act of worship. They went to worship, but the lad and I will come back. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and, and there behind him was a ram. Coincidence? I don't think so. But it was a ram, not a man, but a male lamb, a near fulfillment type for the coming man, Christ Jesus. Caught there in a thicket by its horns, and so Abraham went and took the ram, and I'm thinking by this time he's just, you know, you know oh God, thank you, Jesus. No, well, not thank you, Jesus, but you know, thank you, God. <laughs> but that's what we would say, right? Hello? There's been an accident. Oh, my Lord. We'll call you back with the details. Hello? Everybody's fine. The cars are wrecked, but everybody may, oh, thank you, God. Someone like that, you deal, right? Those calls that you don't want to get at night. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering. Man, you, think, you don't think they worship? You don't think they sing that song, Jehovah Jireh? Well, it probably wasn't out yet, but. And he offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. Yeah. Now go back to Hebrews again. Hold your finger in Genesis. We're almost done. 19. All of that, all that backstory, right? Concluding, he says. Now, that word concluding is where we get our word logic. Means to compute, means to calculate, means a reason through a conclusion. Here's a a logical conclusion from all of this based upon God's character shown and known and learned by Abraham, he came to a logical conclusion. Verse 19, it says, that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also received them in a figurative sense. Back to Genesis 22, verse 14. And Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide. As it said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. See, Calvary's true name should be the Lord will provide. Or for us, on this side of the cross, the Lord has provided. He has provided his son. Well, then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham, verse 15, the second time, out of heaven and said, by myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Blessing, I will bless you. Multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven. And as the sand which is on the seashore, this is again a repeat of the covenant. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. The Apostle Paul gives to us a commentary on why all the nations shall be blessed by his seed. It's found in Galatians 3.16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds, as of many, but as one, and to your seed, who is Christ. He clarifies that. This all came to pass, friends, 
This all came to pass, as God says, because you have obeyed my voice. I'm gonna give you another one. This is the first time the word obeyed is used in the scripture. And isn't it interesting in context that has to do with obeying God and no other? Obeying God? So as we wrap this up, what is God asking us to obey? What is God asking you to obey this morning? Could it be baptism? Since we have the baptismal here, you've accepted Christ as your Savior, but you're wrestling for whatever reason of baptism? Oh, well, Pastor, I was baptized as a baby. Well, so was I. That meant nothing to me and all to my parents because their denomination called for infant baptism. But when I became a believer and I read the scriptures to believe and to be baptized is what we are to do. Maybe that's it. Maybe God has been telling you and speaking to you, get baptized, obey my word. Could it be something you have been wrestling with God about? And you've come in here and you're still wrestling? Abraham's faith was tested, tested so that our faith can be trusted today. What we just read should have encouraged you that you can trust God and trust his word. But it comes with obedience. Because to obey is better to, than what? Sacrifice. Obey is better than sacrifice. What is he commanding us to obey today? Abraham's obedience was the evidence of his faith. So Father, we thank you, God, for walking us through this wonderful chapter, for allowing us to worship you and honor you through it, Lord. I pray if there's anyone here today, God, that is just struggling through something that they just need to obey or going through a test that they will stay, stay in the storm, stay in the valley. God is with you. Obey the Lord. Allow him to bless you as you obey his word. Help us, God. We're imperfect, Lord. We struggle with so many things. But we have the more sure word and it builds our faith up. Thank you for this morning, God. We ask it in Jesus' name. Everyone set? I'll be right back.